On today's video, we're going to understand the city of Miami, its different neighborhoods, and the characteristics and nationalities of each of these communities. Here is the city of Miami, as seen on Google Maps. You can see there's an airport, there's some islands over here like Miami Beach, North Miami Beach. Here is a race map of Miami. The orange will represent Hispanic, the green will represent black, and the blue will represent white. You can see that the Hialeah area is mostly Hispanic. This is largely a Cuban community. However, you can see there's a pocket right here in Northwest Miami. This area here is Hispanic, but it's Dominican. That means it's mostly black Hispanics living in here. This entire neighborhood is Hispanic. When you look at Miami, Southwest Miami, the Latin Quarter and Little Havana, this was historically a Cuban community. However, today there are Salvadorians, Nicaraguans, Many South and Central Americans live in this area here. You can see there's a small white population right outside of the Miami skyline. Heading further into West Miami, you'll find a large Cuban community that's kind of like a middle class, and there's a lot of older retired people. This is a historic Cuban community. There's also a university here, which means there's a lot of young people as well. So this is kind of like a family-oriented Hispanic community. Predominantly Cuban, but there's a little bit of everything, even a little bit of Asian in this area. It's just a very nice area. When you come further down into Miami, around the Kendall area, you'll start to see there's larger pockets of white population. These larger pockets of white population are because this is a very wealthy area. This was mostly rich Cubans, Colombians, and many people from Argentina, Colombia. It's just a huge mix of Hispanic wealth. And over the years, as these areas have been kind of wealthier, it's also attracted a white population. You can see here, there is a black community called Richmond Heights in the Kendall area. Back in 2021, I actually drove around Richmond Heights and made a video that I never published. So let's start off today's video by getting a tour that you guys have never seen yet of Richmond Heights. What's up everybody? This is Jose from Southern Life. And Katie. Welcome to Richmond Heights. Check it out. That's what I thought it was. Like I get, I get confused between Richmond Heights and Richmond West. And Oh, you can't go in there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Looks pretty. Looks real pretty. I see a, a pigeon. Where we spent some time once? Yeah, we've been through here before. Done. If you live here, I mean, let me know what it's like to live out here. And we have a subscriber actually that lives here, so shout outs to you. I know you watch my videos. Is that it right there? Okay, what's the house number? You remember like, okay, we were in, um, what was this thing? It was, um, right here. Miami's Cuban population starts to grow in the year 1960 when Fidel Castro takes power. You can see the green line, which is Hispanics, shoots straight up since 1960. That mostly represents Cubans leaving the island of Cuba and coming to the United States. The red line represents the white population. You can see that in the year 1960, white people stopped moving to Miami and the population was stagnant all the way up until the year 1980. And in the 80s, the white population started to leave as the black population started to grow. The timing of the arrival of the Cuban population couldn't have come at a more interesting time as the American Civil Rights Movement was kicking off and this new influx of Cubans and the fact that they received assistance from the US government was an outright outrage to the African American community. The fact that this new group of immigrants was now getting government benefits and a lot of jobs was a complete outrage for the African-American community 
as they felt that they had more rights than these immigrants. African Americans who had fought in the First World War were now returning back to the United States to segregation. Things got so bad in Florida because of the help that Cubans received from the U.S. government that Florida started to desegregate voluntarily the school systems as a way to kind of help ease tensions with the African-American community. As we step into the 2000s, you can see that the African-American communities also had the worst incomes in the Miami area. With the exception of Little Havana, there's almost a perfect correlation between Miami's pockets of poverty and its African-American population. To aggravate the situation even further for Miami's African-American population, a new type of black person had arrived on the scene. As of today, 2% of Florida's population is of Haitian descent. The vast majority of this population initially settled into the Northwest Miami, Florida area, which was historically African-American. Now, despite the fact that the Miami African-American community had been abused and mistreated, now it was them that was the aggressor as they mistreated these new Haitian arrivals. And this is where things in Miami get tricky because despite the fact that Cubans are mostly white and Haitians are black, the Haitian community actually aligned themselves with the Cubans and not with the blacks. The Cuban community helped the Haitian community get established and provided them with defense on the streets so that the Haitians could take care of themselves and protect themselves from any threats. And the Haitian community quickly rose to power, making alliances with Cubans and Colombians in the criminal world gave Haitians the ability to establish their communities and their respect on the streets fairly quickly. About 5% of Cuba's population is of Haitian descent and being neighboring islands in the Caribbean, the food, the culture, the music, and many other aspects of these two communities were very similar, including African religion, which was practiced by many white Cubans. And over the years, the larger Cuban community of Miami has aligned itself with, with Colombians, with Nicaraguans, and now most recently with Dominicans, who are not exactly in best terms with Haitians, being that the island of Hispaniola is a shared island, with one side of the island being Dominican and the other side of the island being Haitian, there tend to be some type of conflicts between these brotherly countries, despite the fact that they are neighbors and they have so much in common, the island of Haiti and the island of the Dominican Republic being the same piece of land, there are still stark differences, and the Haitians and Dominicans do not always get along. And this is where things in Miami kind of become interesting and dicey, you could say, because you do have all these different groups of Latin Americans, but they don't always all get along. Sometimes they make alliances to work together, while other times they outright compete for labor, housing, and other opportunities. And as of right now, as the white population is moving into Miami and prices are starting to increase, the Hispanic communities are starting to displace the African American community out of Miami. The white community and the African American community in Florida have always been at each other's throats because of the South's slavery past. And to this day, the Hispanic community has been used like a pawn or like a buffer between these two communities. And this is a battle that is fought indirectly, which means that the African Americans and the whites are not always going directly at each other, but they're using these immigrant groups as buffers or as pawns between each other in their own internal battle. I'm not really going to break down the political affiliations of these nationalities because at the end of the day, we don't get involved in politics on our channel, but I do want you guys to understand that each one of these communities 
is pretty much aligned politically and also with other communities in Miami in order to compete for employment, housing, and to get a slice of the pie of what's called the American Dream. The area we're looking at now is the Brownsville area, and this is the border between the Hispanic communities in the African American communities that is currently being encroached by the growth of Hispanic communities as prices increase and Hispanics are being forced into the more poor areas. In Northwest Miami, we have a Hispanic community. This is the Dominican community. Let's go on the ground and see what this part of Miami looks like. As you leave downtown Miami and head into the Northwest area of the city, you will encounter the Dominican neighborhood. This is one of the most dangerous parts of Miami. The largest concentration of Dominicans in the United States is actually in New York. However, there's an increase of Dominicans from New York moving to Florida, and this community is now growing. Dominicans are kind of admired by a lot of Hispanic communities for their music. They have many genres of music like merengue and bachata that have become the staple of Hispanic culture. So you have to understand that Dominicans, while being a small community, have a lot of cultural influence within the Hispanic community. They also control a huge network of the illegal market of things coming into the United States from South America. So despite not being the largest community in the Miami area, they're definitely a tough community. Recently, in the last few years, the Afro-Cuban community has started to grow. See, back home in Cuba, there's also a large percentage of black people, and they had historically never left the island. Now there's a huge percentage of Cubans that are coming that are Afro-Cuban, and these Afro-Cubans are starting to align themselves with the Dominicans. And currently, culturally, there's starting to be a fusion between the Dominican music and entertainment world and the Cuban music and entertainment world as this influx of new Dominicans and new Afro-Cubans are gathering in this part of Miami, you're starting to hear a new Afro-Cuban Dominican sound coming out of Miami. And as we have seen so far in the video, Miami is really a melting pot of cultures, but within that melting pot, a lot of communities align with other communities and are at odds with others. Haitians continue to be the largest black community within South Florida and African Americans a second. However, there's starting to be a new influx of black Cubans and Dominicans, which means that it's possible that in the future there could be even more competition for the northwest side of Miami as this historically has been the area where blacks live in Miami. And this continual desire of communities wanting to settle into Miami has meant that the real estate prices in the Miami area continue to grow. Little Haiti is in Northwest Miami, and it is the home to the Haitian community, as the name would suggest. Little Haiti was made famous on the internet with musical artist Lil Wayne making music videos here, and the neighborhood being mentioned on a lot of music coming out of Louisiana. Keep in mind that in Louisiana, you have a Cajun Creole culture, and Haitians speak Creole, so there seems to be some type of cultural similarities between Louisiana and Haiti. Food, music, and pretty much DNA. What's interesting about Little Haiti is that they have really taken the brunt of gentrification because they are the closest community to the water. Most of the white rich communities are along the water, and this is the area that is the most desirable of Miami. Little Haiti is exactly not a rich area, but the real estate being close to downtown Miami and close to the water has made Little Haiti increasingly attractive to investors and people trying to gentrify Miami. And the poor Haitian community has really struggled to hold on to Little Haiti. It's a battle of rich people against really poor communities and wanting to take their land because now Little Haiti is absolutely desirable for a lot of reasons from its elevation 
to its location. Gentrification has shamelessly moved into this area and many Haitians have had to resettle in Broward County, Fort Pierce, and other more affordable cities. As I did the research for this video, I discovered something that is kind of disturbing. If you look at the area in green on top of the first map on the left, you can see that the model city, which is the African American community of Miami, actually has very good educational attainment. However, if you look on the right, they still have a lot of poverty. And as you can see from this comment we received on our channel just seven hours ago, in the Miami area, having a degree or an education means absolutely nothing if you're black. There's actually as much poverty in the educated black community of Miami as there is within uneducated pockets of the black community that are mostly Haitian, which means getting an education in Miami makes absolutely no difference. Your race is more important than your education level. And that right there is a very bad prospect for a lot of African Americans. However, when you look at the income, you'll see the bottom of the map, the southwest side of Miami, Hispanics, although a lot of these communities don't really have the best education, they do have less poverty rates. Therefore, today in Miami, your race means more than your educational background. In Miami, with Spanish being the dominant language in a lot of business places, a Hispanic that is not even a ninth grade education level could have a better economical prospect than a black person with a bachelor's degree. In South Miami, there's another small black community off of Grand Avenue nestled between a Hispanic and a rich white area is a small pocket of black population. Here, there's a lot of people from the Bahamas and other parts of the Caribbean. Again, as we cruise through Coconut Grove, you'll notice a lot of gentrification. However, I do feel like in Coconut Grove, the gentrification has not really destroyed the essence of this Caribbean community. Miami is like the capital of Latin America, and you're going to find Bahamian, Trinidadian, and all types of Caribbean communities within the area of Miami. Of course, these smaller islands like the Bahamas and Trinidad are going to have a much smaller presence in Miami, and their communities are not going to be as big. There is a little bit of poverty here. However, with the real estate being so attractive in this part of Miami, the prices to live poor in Miami, especially here, are extravagant. This is the most expensive place in America to be poor. A lot of the African American communities in South Dade have also started to grow as prices are increasing in Northwest Miami. But due to the high demand for this valuable real estate in Miami, close to downtown and close to the water, there are properties around here that are pushing over $50 million for large residential properties. And individual pieces of land, if you can find them, are going to be into the tens of millions, which means that this small African American community with its Caribbean influence is almost guaranteed to have to disappear in the future. The pressure on the Coconut Grove community to gentrify and for real estate prices to just continue to grow at rates that are just completely unsustainable for the residents is almost guaranteed as the real estate prices in this part of Miami are some of the most ridiculous in the entire country. The notion that all black or Hispanic communities have to be poor is definitely not true in the Miami area. As we can see from Coral Gables of a large Hispanic community in Coconut Grove being black, there's definitely a lot of wealth in all these communities. Demand for Miami's real estate continues to grow and the pressure is coming from a lot of different directions. Both people leaving the northeast of the United States, other countries like Brazil and Russia, are also starting to look at Miami as a place to live. Some of these groups like Venezuelans, Russians, are coming to the United States with good economical mobility. It means they have the ability to take a hold of real estate that is very expensive and easily drive out communities that were there before them 
that just can't afford to keep up with the rising prices. Many times the people that end up in Miami don't end up in Miami because they want to, like the case of New Yorkers who move to Miami because they think it's trendy. You have to understand that when you look at communities like Russians and Venezuelans, these are not poor people immigrating to another country for opportunity. They are absolutely magnificently wealthy people who are fleeing a country where their wealth is under threat. Take the case of Sunny Isles Beach. This is a very expensive community right on the water in Miami. Russians in particular and a lot of Europeans with more money than you could imagine have bought up this entire section of Miami. Many times Americans ignorantly believe that all immigrants that come to the United States are these poor hungry people looking for opportunity that are going to take your job. What they fail to notice is that today a lot of the immigrant groups that are coming to the United States like Russians and Venezuelans are actually freaking loaded. They're not going to be taking your job anytime soon. They'll be taking your house if you put it on the market. And despite all the legal hurdles of just coming over here and buying real estate, a lot of these people don't really care. At the end of the day, they're not leaving their country because they have to. They're ending up over here because if they stay in their home country, they're going to lose all their money and possibly even their dang life. So they really don't care. They're going to come over here and they're going to buy expensive real estate and enjoy their wealth because back home, whatever the situation may be, they're not safe. And a lot of people fail to notice that even a poor country like Haiti can have incredible economic implications to the communities they're tied to in a place like Florida. Don't ever assume that Haitians, Dominicans, and these communities are poor don't have a huge economical impact on a place like Miami. Miami is a huge player in international trade. And as places like Central America and Latin America go into chaos, a lot of the international operations based in those countries shift into places like Miami. And there's a huge global implication to the economy in a place like Miami. And while the vast majority of communities like Central Americans and Haitians are not exactly wealthy communities here in the United States, there's a lot of economical impact by having those people here in the United States managing their assets in other parts of the world. This is a little aggravating for a lot of Americans. They've had the power to keep the African American community down, but when it comes to these international communities that have global ties, there's a lot of resentment against Miami in the United States. And I think part of that resentment is just the fact that they're not able to prevent people from getting rich here or from bringing their wealth from other places and be in the United States, obtain a lot of financial mobility without having to be despaired or marginalized by the American system of discrimination. I find it really interesting that as I talk to people all over the United States about Miami, they're very frustrated and they have a lot of resentment for this city. And when you ask them the reasons why they hate Miami, one of the reasons that I get most often is they don't understand how those people came here and have so much money when I'm from here and I don't have it. It really bothers a lot of Americans when they go to vacation to Miami and see all these other communities of people from other parts of the world living in the United States and obtaining a lot of financial mobility. Many times these people will make false assumptions or accusations and you'll hear a lot of bad things said about Miami that are clearly not true. One of those things is that Miami is a dangerous city. It might have been in the 80s when a lot of the bad stuff in the United States was going on. But as of right now, Miami and its suburbs sit among the safest cities in the United States. The suburbs of Miami have some of the lowest murder rates in the country. Louisville, Cincinnati, Indianapolis... A lot of cities in the Midwest are having murder rates as much as three times higher 
than a place like Miami. And many of the cities in Florida, whether Hispanic or white in composition, are going to have some of the lowest murder rates in the United States for city their sizes. The narrative that Miami is this dangerous crime infested city that many people push throughout the United States is absolutely wrong. And many of the smart people are starting to realize that Miami is a safe city. People are becoming aware of that and they're starting to move to Miami. That's why you're now seeing this huge influx of white people trying to get into Miami because these communities have actually done a lot of great things for themselves. One of the things they've done is to keep one of the lowest murder rates in the country. Crime is actually not as much of a concern in Miami as it is in other cities. Of course, you have 5 million people in the metropolitan area. You're going to have pockets that are going to be bad. Any city this size is going to have bad areas. And there's no doubt that Miami has its fair share of bad and dangerous areas. But as a whole, there's incredibly low crime rates in the Miami area. Take Hialeah, for example. Despite having increasingly horrible traffic, the highest population density in the south, you still have a murder rate in the city of Hialeah that's below the state average and below the national average. Just the fact that an urban core can have a murder rate lower than the national average, which is mostly rural areas, is astonishing to itself. Of course, you would never know that if you ask somebody in the Midwest what they think about Miami. The vast majority of ignorance in the United States is just to assume that because Miami is predominantly a Hispanic city, that it's this dangerous, horrible place. But the statistics don't lie. Miami is one of the most attractive cities. And in fact, it's becoming the most expensive city in the country because people are aware of its many attractive qualities. Take me, I'm a YouTuber who travels all over the country. Miami is possibly one of the only large urban cores that I would move to without any hesitation. In fact, I've been dreaming about living in Miami, just the cost and the employment options have kept me out. But if it didn't come to that, if I was able to afford it, Miami would hands down be the number one place I would go to. Another false accusation that I hear about Miami a lot is that all the money here is dirty and all the money here comes from illegal profits. That's the case for a lot of people, but I can tell you that I have known a lot of people in Miami who obtained a lot of wealth and they are the most honest people you could imagine. Certainly, just like there's corruption and people who go to illegal means, Anywhere in the world, there's a lot of illegal money in Miami. Is every rich person in Miami related to crime and illegal money? Absolutely not. Movies like Scarface have done a huge damage to the community of Miami, giving Cubans the appearance of all being these dirty, angry criminals who are willing to stop at nothing to become wealthy. And while that's definitely the case of people like myself, I'm just playing. <laughs> I'm just kidding, y'all. Apart from the false claims of Miami being dangerous, the claim that every dollar in Miami comes from illicit activities is also redundant. Even the poor communities like Dominicans, Haitians, Central Americans are going to have some type of real estate ties, trade ties that are legitimate and make a lot of money. I have a great friend from the Dominican Republic. If you saw him on the street, you would assume he's a poor person. They have a lot of real estate in several countries. And it is true that if you're making a crap load of money illicitly and now you hit it big and have to flee your country with your millions of dollars, that Miami would probably be the place to go to. But that's not a fair assumption to generalize over the people of Miami. Miami is one of the hardest working cities in the world. If you go to Miami, you'll realize that the traffic jams start early, the commutes are long, the rents are high, the jobs don't pay very well. The people that live here are what I call the hustlers of the world. You will be hard pressed to find a harder working community than Miami unless you go to New York City or Los Angeles. And one of the things that hurts me the most 
is to see the things that people have to say about Miami. Like I've literally been in Ocala or Tallahassee or Jacksonville or Alabama or Georgia, and I can just overhear people talking about how horrendous Miami is and how they were robbed there in 1972. It's mostly just anti-Hispanic rhetoric, and at the end of the day, a lot of people are mad because the discrimination that they've tried to perpetrate throughout the entire country of the United States has not been successful in preventing people in Miami from picking up a big bag. Just look at the African American communities in places like Kansas, that when the black people built their own business districts that were actually really successful, Whenever the black side of town would start to look better than the white side of town, whether well, it would just come and burn it down. This is in the state of Kansas. Look it up if you don't believe me. And take the model city area of Miami, which has the same education levels as some of the white communities, but they're in stark contrast economically. Unfortunately, for a lot of people in the United States, even if they live in a community where people are trying to be successful, they're being held back. Even if they go and get an education, you're still black or Hispanic or some other background. And it seems like, quite frankly, when it comes to the United States, people want to portray certain communities as criminal, lazy, uneducated, with no desire to be successful. But when they do attain to the education, when they do attain to being hardworking and law-abiding citizens, they still get held back. Now you hop on over to Broward County and it's a little different. There's a few communities like Coral Springs, Parkland, Plantation, Miramar, where the African Americans control the economy there. And I want to be clear about this, that Miami-Dade County has a powerful Hispanic community that tries to get all the jobs for themselves and all the opportunities for themselves. But you hop on over to Broward County and there are some very successful African American communities there. And you do see a lot of very successful communities that are predominantly African American. Nice, beautiful suburbs. Some of these communities in Broward County have the best outlook for African Americans anywhere in the country. Surpassing places like New York and California. Another huge resentment that people have about the community of Miami is that as Hispanics around the 1980s started to get more power, they started to get their own mayors, they started to get their own city council, and even further up in government, Cubans became a very powerful political element. Now, you have an influx of other communities like Dominicans and Venezuelans, and they're also power fighting amongst each other, fragmenting the overall power of the Hispanic communities. Take the community of Doral in western Dade County. This community overnight became the center of Venezuela's influx of wealthy people into the United States. They literally bought an entire suburb out all for themselves. This influx of wealthy and affluent Venezuelans was definitely a problem for a lot of the other Hispanics in Dade County who felt perhaps jealous that now out of nowhere these people with a lot of money from a different country showed up and bought everything. A lot of people in Miami that I have met really resent the Venezuelan community. I'm going to guess it's probably just envy. But these were people that were wealthy, arrogant, and affluent in their home country, and they didn't leave because they wanted to, they left because they had to. I was recently in Kentucky and Indiana, and you're going to find Venezuelan restaurants opening all over the country in very remote places. And when you look at the reviews, a lot of the customers say that the customer service is horrible, the workers don't speak English, and they only want to cater to other Hispanic customers. And a lot of times they're blatantly racist against the American customers, which is kind of interesting. I mean, if you open a restaurant in a small town in Indiana, you would almost assume that you'd have to cater to an American customer. But they're wealthy, arrogant, and affluent. They really don't care. And just like if you grabbed a bunch of Americans from the United States and forced them to move to another country... They perhaps would not be the friendliest and most openly uh, 
willing to change their culture. A lot of the Venezuelans that are coming to the United States have very little intentions to integrate themselves to the culture of ways of the American people. Again, they're not here because they want to. They're here because they have to. While I've met some incredible Venezuelan people who are humble, kind, and gentle, I will say that I've also met a lot of them that are in fact very arrogant, like the stereotype would suggest. Understandably, there's going to be hard feelings on both sides of that. Understandably, the Americans want people that come to the United States to speak their language. That's a reasonable request in a lot of ways. You can't force people. I mean, the First Amendment of the United States is a freedom of speech. So if they want to speak another language and they're legally here, they have the right to do it. But on the other hand, the people that are coming here, they didn't come here for you. They came here for them. And understandably as well, they think they're going to end up going back to their home country and that they're not here permanently. They're just here temporarily until things get resolved. But unfortunately, as we have seen with all these communities, whether Cuban or Haitian or even other communities that were established way before, like Italians and Irish, I don't think they realize that there's no going back home to your country. A lot of the first Cubans that arrived in the 1960s thought they were only going to be here for a little bit. Now they have grandchildren born here, and a lot of them don't even speak Spanish anymore. They only speak English, which means that the Venezuelans might have hopes of returning back to their country and getting things worked out, but unfortunately, it's more likely, if you look at all the other immigrant communities that have come over here, that most likely they're not going to be able to go back to their country. And while a lot of them are just kind of refusing to assimilate to the culture, the sad reality is that most likely they're going to be here a lot longer than they think. You know, the Irish came here because they ran out of potatoes. The Italians came here because they ran out of salami. The Cubans came here because they ran out of Cuban coffee. We all came here for different reasons, but... Eventually, you all have to assimilate to American culture. I think it's going to be very difficult with this new wave of affluent immigrants coming to the United States because it used to be that only poor people came to the United States. And now that you have rich people coming here, they're likely going to be a little bit more arrogant and a little bit more hesitant to assimilate. I'll be the first to admit that the first time I've met Venezuelans, it wasn't under the nicest circumstances. You have people who were very wealthy in Venezuela, one of the richest, actually the most oil rich country in the world. Their, their oil supplies are actually bigger than a lot of Arab countries. They have a huge supply of oil. This is a very wealthy country. And the first ones that I met were just not the people you'd want to meet. They're very wealthy. They were not happy to be here, so you could assume that the first one as well as we met weren't exactly the best specimens. It's kind of like meeting somebody who lost their home in a natural disaster like a tornado or a hurricane. They're not exactly the happiest people at that moment. I will tell you this, if you have never tried Venezuelan food, it is amazing. It, it's like... Unlike any other cuisine that I have ever had, both Colombian and Venezuelan cuisines are incredible. But Venezuelan cuisine, everywhere that I have had it, has always absolutely been incredible. So if you've never had Venezuelan food, I definitely recommend that you try it because it really is amazing. And the beauty about Miami is that every new coming group of people that lands in Miami, whether it's Haitians or Venezuelans or Cubans or Dominicans, brings their own flavor to the table. And every time you have a new influx of a new community, they have something special to bring to the table. And in the case of Venezuelans, it's definitely their food. And these days, when you go to Miami, you'll notice that a lot of the Cubans are listening to Dominican music and eating Venezuelan food, which means that Miami continues to be an incredible melting pot. And sure, a lot of people, including Cubans and other Hispanics, definitely resent that the Venezuelan community that ended up in Miami is just a whole lot better off than everybody else. And I can tell you, for the short period that I stayed and worked in Miami, the thing that I loved the most was the food. One day we'd have Venezuelan, the next we'd have Colombian, then we would have Bahamian, then we would have Haitian, then we would have like Jamaican. 
every single day was a different meal. It was affordable for the most part, and it was so good. The worst part about living in Miami was clearly the traffic. I only worked in Miami for a brief period, but I can tell you that it was amazing. The most challenging part about Miami is that every nationality has their own way of doing business. Without a doubt, the most challenging part about Miami was that, just doing business interactions, because every person that walked through the door, you didn't know what type of business practices they would throw at you. Would they be stingy? Would they try to offer way less than they were supposed to? Or were they just a cash-in-hand buyer, not willing to mess around too much? A lot of the people that I dealt with in Miami seemed redundantly arrogant with their money. Doing business in Miami is challenging. You just never know what that person's going to walk through the door with. Every country usually has a different custom for doing business. And what's acceptable in one part of the world definitely is not in the next. If you can make it in Miami, you can literally make it anywhere because it really is a difficult and challenging place to do business. All right, everybody. So we're going to finish today's video in Little Havana, which is the historic Cuban community. Today, Little Havana has not exactly retained its Cuban population. A lot of the groups that are living here now, like Salvadorians, Central Americans, Andorians, do respect the heritage and what it represents for Hispanics in America, but it's more of a symbolic respect for what this initial Hispanic community did. Cubans are no longer the largest group here. A lot of Cuban communities have moved into Kendall and West Miami, more suburban areas. They're an established community and they've been able to move into better areas. Today, Little Havana is sadly a little bit dangerous, but it still retains so much flavor and so much life that a lot of tourists are still flocking here despite the neighborhood's dangerous reputation. This neighborhood is possibly the most authentic Miami experience you can have, which a lot of tourists are still shying away from, and going into more artificial areas like Wynwood or Miami Beach, which are really just tourist destinations and not the real Miami. Despite the fact that Cubans are no longer the largest group here, this is still the most Miami experience you could have. This neighborhood was initially made known to general mainstream media by the artist named Pitbull, who was initially a rapper and today is more like a pop singer. A lot of hardcore Miamians are going to tell you that Pitbull is nothing more than a sellout these days, who initially became famous doing collaborations with Atlanta artists like Little John, while Rick Ross represented the Little Haiti community, Opalaka, and Northwest Miami. Pitbull would grab the Latin communities of Miami and bring them into mainstream rap. However, as things progressed for Pitbull, he decided to be more profitable to enter the world of more pop-like music, and in that world, he made himself a crap load of money. And a lot of Cuban Americans can relate with Pitbull's evolution from wearing baggy camouflage t-shirts and 5X white tees to looking a little bit more refined these days. Not surprisingly, that's all what mainstream culture has done anyways. Nonetheless, the tales of Pitbull, rags to riches, coming to the United States, working as a dishwasher, and being somewhat scarface determined not to continue living in poverty is definitely a very interesting approach to the American dream. And the final neighborhood we're going to talk about is an area known as Opalaka. This area of Miami is also infamous thanks to music. Many artists like Rick Ross, Donk Riders, just to name a few. The area of Miami has definitely been mentioned in popular culture. Opalaka was mostly a Haitian community, but it is increasingly becoming Hispanic. Anybody familiar with Opalaka knows that it is astonishing how high the real estate prices have got here. This was an unattractive place for real estate. Nobody would think about buying properties in real estate here. 
But the prices have increased ridiculously. And now Opelaka is no longer viewed as just a dangerous part of Miami with bad real estate prices and maybe boarded up houses. No, Opelaka is actually becoming very attractive. And of course, the Hispanic communities, Cubans being displaced out of other parts of Miami, are the first ones moving into here. But you're also seeing other Hispanics from Latin America move into this part of Miami. The famous and iconic Opelaka flea market, where Cubans and Haitians traded goods, is no longer open. While there is still a long way to go for the Opelaka community, every time I come here I see more progress, less crime, more gentrification, properties that I remember were boarded up with plywood on the windows today have beautiful palm trees in the front. Opelaka is definitely a changing community. Nonetheless, there's still a long way to go. The location of Opelaka in the north central part of Miami means that as traffic and congestion and people commuting becomes a bigger, never-ending nightmare, Opelaka has just become more attractive. And with people getting displaced along other parts of Miami because Again, the gentrification means that more people are looking at places like Opelaka as a place to live. And like we mentioned earlier in the video, there's always been kind of a battle between African Americans and Blacks and Hispanics within this county in order to obtain housing and economical opportunities. And this has resulted in parts of Broward County becoming Blacker and parts of Hispanic Miami expanding into previously African-American areas. And Opelaka was a different place. It used to be a safe white community that eventually went into poverty and as white flight people left Miami became almost entirely black. Now the Opelaka area is becoming almost like a beautiful Hispanic area, not exactly suburban yet, but definitely more affluent than it was when the houses were boarded up and empty. And something tells me that once it becomes pretty enough, Hispanics will start moving out as they get outpriced by whites. We're not quite there yet, but something tells me that in the future, Opelaka will probably be a white area again. Remember that earlier in the video, I used the word buffer as to how Hispanics are a buffer between the black and the white. And this is a great example. I really feel that once Opelaka becomes Hispanic, then eventually whites will start to move in. And that is how the whites indirectly make the Hispanics be a buffer between them and the blacks. Opelaka also has the largest collection of Moorish revival architecture in the Americas. That's just a random fact. Miami also has a large Jewish population and there is surprisingly a lot of religious diversity as well, not just ethnic in Miami. And nonetheless, it is interesting how the place that was the struggle for immigrant communities is now attractive to the people that fled because of those immigrant communities. Needless to say, there was really much nothing in South Florida in the 50s and a lot of the whites that moved to South Florida originally came from Georgia and from Alabama. Florida was at the time more poor and bad off than Alabama or Mississippi. Like Florida was the butt of the jokes in Mississippi and Alabama. There was really nothing in Florida and those first groups of people from Alabama and Georgia that moved to Florida were not there for a very long time. By the 1960s, as Hispanics started to grow in Florida, specifically the Miami area, the white population stopped growing in Miami, and by the 80s, it started to shrink. Ironically, now that rich whites are moving into Miami, a lot of the people like Cubans and Haitians and other Hispanics are leaving Miami and moving back into North Florida, Georgia, and even some parts of Alabama. Clearly an ironic plot twist. All right, the last map that I want to show you guys is an interesting one. You can see Cubans are red, 
South Americans are blue, Mexicans are purple, and Puerto Ricans are green. You can see that South Central Florida around Lake Okeechobee has large Mexican communities from Felsmere as far north, Immokalee and La Belle being the strongest concentration, moving inland through Hardy and, of course, DeSoto, Hillsboro, and Polk County. This area has a large Mexican concentration in the inland parts. Notice a small coastal community of Mexicans along southwest Florida in Fort Myers Beach and in Naples. Clearly a pocket of Cubans in Miami in red. Broward County, all that blue is going to be South Americans. That's going to be Colombians, Venezuelans, Brazilians, and other types of South Americans. You can see that from Tampa and into Orlando, Kissimmee, there's a huge area that's green. That's going to be for sure Puerto Ricans. So you can generalize that Miami's Cubans, Broward County, South Americans, Mexicans are in inland South Central Florida, and Orlando is a huge pocket of Puerto Ricans. And on the left, you can see that Miami has been zoomed in. That blue square in the heart of Miami is the Venezuelan community of Doral. The deep reds is going to be Hialeah in the north, and the deep reds in the south is southwest Miami. I noticed that along the coast, there's a lot of blue. I'm going to assume those are going to be Colombians and Venezuelans, but if anybody else knows what those blues along the coast are. Are there Brazilians in there as well? Because South American is a very broad term. So if anybody that's more familiar with Miami wants to elaborate on that South American community along the coast and what countries that compromises, that would be really awesome. All right, everybody. So that's today's video on Miami. I hope you guys liked it. Do you believe that Opalaka will eventually become completely Hispanic and then whites will start to move in. If anybody thinks that's possible, let me know in the comments. Obviously, we've seen with Miami that it's completely unpredictable. If something in another part of the world happens, chances are Miami could change drastically at any moment. And while in the past, groups like Cubans and Haitians have come to South Florida with just about nothing in their hands, today immigrant groups come to Miami have a lot of money. And of course, the ignorant mindsets of outsiders who just want to label Miami as the worst thing possible. A lot of longtime Miamians are leaving the city, but are discovering that they're not being welcomed into the rural communities in North Florida or South Georgia, South Alabama that they're moving to. But as Cubans and other Latinos from Miami leave Miami looking for a rural dream in America, Many find themselves in Colorado and North Carolina. Many discover that despite the fact they hate the traffic and the ridiculous cost of life in Miami, once you fall in love with Miami, it's hard to like something else. And despite artists like Pitbull who've tried to create a bridge between the Cuban and African American communities, unfortunately today when I look through my YouTube channel, I get a lot of comments from African Americans saying, that they're just not happy with the treatment they're getting in Dade County. So many people want to live in Miami, but not everybody can afford it. And unfortunately, some of the people who can afford it are sadly the ones that are from there. All right, guys, I hope you guys liked the video as usual. If you found the video to be insightful, entertaining, Please support our channel by contributing with your thoughts and opinions in the comment section. I think the biggest thing that I learned while drawing up the information statistics to come up with this video is how unaware I was of how difficult the African American community has had it in Miami. Nonetheless, every single community that makes up Miami has contributed great things to the city and its culture. Whether it's sports, music, or food, everybody brings something different to the table, making Miami be one of the most culturally rich cities in the country, if not the whole entire world. A city that influences not only music and culture or fashion, but also trade itself. Some people landed here with nothing and they made something out of nothing. 
Some people came here with a lot and they didn't really want to be here. Other people worked their entire lives so they could be here. Yet some people are from here and they have nothing to show for it. Every one of these communities does something to make Miami be one of the greatest cities in the world, contributing to its culture in some way or another. Hialeah gave Miami KC and the Sunshine Band. Southwest Miami gave Miami Pitbull, Mr. Worldwide. Northwest Miami gave the world Trina, Rick Ross, who's really from Mississippi, but we'll talk about that in another video. Trick Daddy. The two live crew from Liberty City. And today, new artists from Venezuela and the Dominican Republic, as well as Afro-Cubans, are creating a new sound that mixes Dominican, Cuban, Brazilian, and many other music to make a new distinct sound that is Caribbean, it's Cuban, it's Dominican, but it's most of all a Miami sound. Do you love Miami or do you hate it? Hit me up in the comments and let me know what you think.